Help presents Stress-Free Living with Ray Savage and Mr. Stress-Free, Ratanjit S. Sandhi. This audio program is an unscripted and unrehearsed conversation between Ray and Ratanjit. It is shared with you in hope of adding value to your life. We encourage you to listen to this program in its entirety to receive the full impact of its message. Sit back, relax, open your heart, mind, and soul to this edition of Stress-Free Living. Welcome to Stress-Free Living. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm Ray Samich, and I have the uh, great privilege and honor to introduce all of you to my radio colleague, co-host, and my spiritual brother, Ratanjit Sandhi. Ratanjit, how are you? Wonderful, wonderful, Ray. How are you? Excellent, thank you. We're going to talk about competition today, and we certainly are not competing with our wonderful guests that are joining us here on our Zoom channel. If you would like to be a part of that with us, where we can interact with you before, during, and after the show, we welcome you. Easiest way to do that is to go out to our YouTube channel, just Google search on YouTube, Stress-Free Living Radio, and you'll see about 100 shows on there that you can watch, but also you'll get the link so that you can join us live and be a part of our show. We'd love to have you. Ratanjit, competition. It just seems that we are becoming more and more competitive as a society. We've got sports going on right now. And everybody has to have their team win. If they win, they're happy. If they don't win, they're miserable. They they carry on for days and weeks sometimes, especially now like during playoff season for different sports, your team, if you lose, you're done. They're going to be miserable for weeks and months if their team loses and if they're done. We compete in business. We compete in sports. We compete with our families, with our siblings. We compete perhaps with our spouse. Children compete against each other constantly for attention. They they compete for who's best and, and who's fastest and all these things. Is that a part of our nature, Ratanji? Is that just part of our human structure to be competitive with other people? See, competitiveness or competition in its essence is challenge, challenge to improve. Because competition is required constantly to find a better way, a better solution, better product, better service. And so that is essential. For, our, for a society to progress. So we have that mindset within us to constantly improve because what, what happens is when we think from our egoic me, this competition gets converted into I am better than you. And I want to be better than you. So that allows a different kind of thing. Although many, many people uh, use that to improve themselves. So that part, improvement is, we need to do that. But if you improve that for the sake of adding higher value, making making your uh, contribution better rather than defeating somebody else. There's two scenarios reaching to the same place. When we compete against somebody else to defeat the competition uh, or defeat the fellow com competitor, so then our ego comes in the way so that that is it it creates a wrong emotions and wrong hormones wrong things in our body in our systems and even if when we win so although we are basically enhancing our egoic self worth we don't enhance our real self worth Ray? 
competing to improve is one thing. And, and I like that idea. I think everybody understands that. But we've taken that and we've gone to compete to win. And when I gave some examples earlier, I didn't do anything with schools. And in the school environment with, with families, you know, you, you, you have to be the top of the class. If you are an intelligent person, they know that my child is intelligent. They want you to be the valedictorian. They want you to be the smartest kid in the class. If you have siblings, and I grew up in this environment, so I, I know this personally, and I have no problem with how I was raised, but I was, you know, your brother did this. We need you to do that, or we need you to do better than that. Uh, and, you know, this this was the way it was a friendly competition, a friendly rivalry. We never were upset with each other, but if he if he was this ranking in high school, then I was supposed to be the same ranking or better. It was just expected, you know, so it wasn't without a measurement of winning. That's it's hard to kind of say that we improve. I mean, unless you move up in class, let, let's say you're a, a, long, a, a runner on a track team. If you came in fifth and then the next time you came in fourth, that's your measurement of improving. So, you know, I'm that closer. Now I, I want to win. I want to be first. But at least if I go from fifth to third, I've I've shown improvement, measurable improvement, and I'm that much closer to winning. You have to understand that we are we have to scale it. We we have to have some way of measurement, and the ultimate measurement is by winning. You know, to improve in in order to get uh, your your fourth, in order to get second or first, in its purest form is improvement. In its egoic form, you start hating the person who is ahead of you, and you are trying to defeat them in your mind, which is egoic mindset, which is incorrect. It, it is going to generate wrong hormones in your body system, and you are going to poison your own system rather than uh, keeping it on the line of pure improvement. And when you are purely improving, then you can have a higher respect for the person who is first, and you observe that person, why he or she is first, what is the special talent, how his skills are different than, so you learn those skills, you learn those things, and you implement that, and when you stand uh, higher ranking, then you thank that person, but because you have learned from that person, so it it is totally a different mindset, and suddenly continuous improvement becomes a habit, rather than you are looking to defeat somebody. When you are looking to defeat somebody, and then what happens is when you are first, and then you do not. You already first. What are you going to improve? It's like a, a there was an interview uh, conducted by uh, between a, a CEO of an American company and a CEO of a Japanese company. And in the interview, you know, they were talking about the business and product they made and uh, everything. So this CEO for American company. Uh, brought out this gadget which this company was manufacturing and he he said you know look at this product this is this is the product we make this is the best in the world and we are very proud of this this product and 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 so again then they in the interview with the japanese companies although japanese company was the leader in in that field in that product already. And, but the Japanese company said, you know, we make this product, but you know, we are trying to improve this aspect of this product. And this is 
little bit not acceptable because this has so it it, it irritated uh, uh, the he mentioned about 10 things which they were going to improve about the product in other words there are 10 defects in the product which they were going to they, they were aware of he never mentioned that he, their product is the best although that product was the best in the industry so that mindset so who is going to lead the industry the person who is constantly improving rather than stopped at the best we already make the best you know general motors in at the time in in before 2008 um, or, or what time when they filed for bankruptcy i don't remember the date and uh, they they were a company manufactured very good cars but they discounted the cars manufactured by the Japanese companies, Toyotas and Hondas, you know, they, they say, oh, we have bigger budget. We have more marketing. We are, we can always beat them. And they, they never really learned from what they were doing. And as a consequence, there was a time the General Motor filed bankruptcy and Toyota accelerated and took away the market. So that mindset always harms you if you are driven by your ego to be the best. That itself is a disease. That itself is a drawback. And most of our competition is ego-driven. Most of our competition is fear-driven. Most of our competition is greed-driven. So those those things come from remaining in the body mode, human body, which is controlling your brain and giving you the reason why you should compete. And these reasons are always going to be fear, greed, ego. And as a consequence, you will stop at your best. We are already best. Whereas when you park, your brain is being guided by your force, divine, enlivening force within you, then ego is absent. You are constantly respecting your competition. You are learning from your competition, and you are constantly improving your last best. Ray? We can't disagree, as always, with anything that you've just said. So, and I'm, I'm so glad you said all of that and you laid that out. I'm trying to think, though, especially when we talk about <clears throat> how we learn to be competitive and if that's inbred or not, that I think it's used as a tool. Competition is laid out there as a tool by whoever is teaching us, whether it's our parents, whether it's our business supervisors or the CEOs of the company. And they are trying to use that to <clears throat> make us to eliminate our complacency, to eliminate our, to, to get us moving, to, if we're lazy, as a child, if a, if a kid is just laying around the house and he has no, you know, ambition to, to get better and to do something. And the, and so the parents start using that to say, Hey, you know, you need to, you need to be better and you need to do more and you need to, if you are in sports, you need to compete. And if you're in the classroom, you need to get better grades. I think that's used as a tool by whoever is trying to motivate us to do better. And it's easy to present that then in the forms of be better than this person or be better than this record or be better than this, uh, this, this time again with the analogy of a race. Uh, you know, you, you were running at three minutes, so you need to make that two minutes to get that completed there is value in that, right? I mean, compared to not doing anything, compared to being complacent and like whatever is good enough is good enough. It doesn't matter if it's if it's all I can be. So 
I think we use that as a tool to get people fired up. In the corporate world, they take it maybe way too far. In a sales meeting for a group, they they get everybody and they rah rah. We're gonna kill the competition. We're gonna we're gonna nail them. We're gonna you know in the Toyota versus General Motors. I'm sure there were times when one of those companies was saying we're gonna beat the other one. We're gonna knock them out. We're gonna put them into bankruptcy. Um, is where does that become bad? Where does that go wrong from the idea of building? action not being complacent to being harmful we have to realize that our inner instinct is constantly to do better we, in order for us to not get bored in order to guess engage with ourselves or we have to constantly improve what we have done so competition is essential for life to remove the boredom. So we have to continue, we have to understand that. So basically, uh, you know, we are, we are going through school, you go from one class to another, so you, you graduate and you, you become happier. You, Although there are new challenges of the, uh, when you go into new class, you know you have to learn more. But the feeling of getting promoted into next class is success. You are improving. You are making a difference. So, so in in life, this progress is measured by. What we have done, we have, have we improved? Have we gotten raised? Have we gotten promoted? Have we? So those things are you. You you are competing, right? And if it is collectively cons considered into a corporation, the corporation is competing, competing to. We have to understand competing to do what? Competing right. not. <laughs> to not to destroy or kill the competition, but to make a better contribution from your product or services. So you are competing against yourself indirectly. You are competing against the last best you have produced if you do not consider that our true competition, you are going to be misguided. So continuously you are improving what you are seeing. And improvement can be achieved by looking at the competition, what they have done, looking at the industry, what they have done, looking at other things you have learned. Those are the learning areas. But destroying the competition is, is is something which is only going to happen if you are only part in your ego, fear, and greed mode. Right. When you said what do uh, what do businesses really want, you know, and this is a whole other story that we're not going to get into today. It's a whole other topic, but unfortunately, many of those businesses are not about comp competition to be the best, to make their best better. They are in a mode to say we need to be profitable because we need to show the shareholders that uh, the stockholders that they're making money with what we have and what we do and so that's a whole nother story because i don't think there is that they may realize ultimately that the way they're going to be profitable is by making their best better but in the short term <clears throat> they disregard that and they just say how do we make money so that's another story for another day, though. Um, I, I don't want to get too far off track on this one. There's enough to enough of this onion to uh, peel with what we've got talking that we are talking about, and what we are talking about this morning, and we're going to come back in just a moment. Is how do we separate that ego from our quest 
for competition. How do we compete in a way that is adding value to ourselves and to others without letting our ego come in? What is the formula for that? Is, is there one? Is there a way that we can separate our ego from the process and still really compete in whatever we're trying to do in a world? And how do we teach our children that concept so that they come up wanting to compete for the right reasons? Stress-free living. We hope you'll be staying with us here. We'll be back in just a moment. All right, we have 90 quick seconds. If anybody would like to contribute a thought. So what goes through my mind as you were talking was, I keep thinking, I keep hearing the stories about the schools and primarily elementary schools. Uh, you know, it's almost like they discourage competition. It's like you keep hearing how they, everybody gets the same grade. Uh, you know, everybody wants, they want people to be equal. And I, and I think it's a way of very bad situation. If that's really going on. I can't speak for sure, but you hear about that a lot. I do know that a couple of years ago, my granddaughter was playing soccer, and I asked my daughter if they won, and she says, "Well, they really didn't, but they didn't keep score." Uh, so it, it, earlier, I, I, and that's okay, maybe at a real young age. And obviously, as they get older, they do keep score. So you do have that sports competition. But I'm that's a good, it's a good angle to, to bring up, Doug. Thank you for bringing that up. I will. Anybody else? Yeah, what about competition versus cooperation? We look at the history of mankind. The greatest achievements have been made by virtue of cooperation. And that's why even today, even though we compete, you know, on a surface level, when there's a big project, the Human Genome Project was not a project done by one scientist, group of scientists for many different countries. Uh, space efforts also, you know, there's a lot of partnerships. Um, we do always do better. So there has to be a realization, this idea of, you know, a competition comes from this evolutionary theory of survival of the fittest, which has been proven to not... We are back on Stress-Free Living. Ray Samich and Ratanji Sandy with you today. Thank you so much for joining us. Talking about competition. Is it something that is healthy? Is it something we should do? Should we teach our kids? And should we use that in the workplace? Is competition the way that we can be better? And how do we take that too far where maybe competition is good at some level, but when it adds in the ego, it isn't. That's what we're kind of talking through. Rats and Jade, a couple of really good points were made by our Zoom guests here during that break. One is that, and I kind of forget about it, so I appreciate him bringing it up. There also seems to be a movement today in a world where they are discouraging competition. They are not keeping score in a lot of the activities, so to speak. They're not, they're giving everybody a, a trophy for just participating. It's kind of a participating mode as opposed to a competition mode. And you hear about that more and more in schools where, you know, we're, we're not, everybody is taking the, the program and we're not going to do grades. We're, we're just going to give you a certificate that you finish the course. What is your thoughts on that? Is, is that? is that a healthy alternative to the idea of I need to be best, I need, I need to be first in the class? What do you think? We have to fundamentally understand that this whole thought process is going against how we are designed. Nature has never, ever duplicated anything. So out of 8 billion people on Earth, each one has a different fingerprint. Each one of us is designed differently. So when we are considering everybody as equal, we basically must provide equal opportunities 
rather than treating everyone as equal. We look at things differently, we develop at things differently, we conceive things differently, so we compete differently. And so as a, as a, when we are allowing people to compete, we are finding uniqueness about them to exhibit. So competition is essential uh, in, in that sense, but the competition is, must be implanted in every child's mind that they are competing against their last best. And as a consequence, they may stand first in the class. That is understandable because when you enhance your own capability continuously, you are going to uh, progress in the overall competition. So that has to be given, a, a, you know, instead of uh, treating everyone as equal, you have to treat everyone as specially equal, special and equally special. And that is how you, you nurture. It is a responsibility for the teachers and responsibility for the parents. You have three children. Parents cannot, each one has a different way of accepting, seeing, listening, and reacting. And they have to understand that. So each, each individual must be treated uniquely. And that has to be understood before we understand the competition. Now, there is another thing as, as you know, in science and technology, uh, there is more cooperation than the competition. Because a, when science publishes a discovery or, or, or a new concept, so that is available to other scientists. They verify repeating that same experiment and they validate that thing and they learn from that understanding which they implement into whatever research they are doing. And that is how we have progressed in inventing new things and new technologies. And when it becomes commercial, we uh, use that as a proprietary thing. So filing a patent is really, in, in, in one sense, then is blocking the progress. I need, respectfully, I need you to, to just pause for a moment because you've entered, you've mixed to me, two different topics. And I want to cover that last one that you just covered. I, I want to talk about that patent and cooperation and things. But I want to go back to the first one, because I think that's so important, Brett and Jade, before you moved, moved over to that second line. You said something just beautiful, and maybe it's been said thousands of times before, but I've never heard it, okay? You are, and I got to write this down, you are to tell my child that you are equally special to tell my employee that you are equally special is very, very empowering. Okay. To tell them that they are equal, I think is not because we know that we're different. We know we can see that we're different. We can see that, that one person is, is 50 pounds and one and one child is 30 pounds that we're not equal we can see that one looks like this and one has brown hair one has blonde hair one has you know whatever the difference might be we see that we're not equal and yet the world is trying to tell us that we're all the same we're not all the same but we are as you said equally special every person was designed to be who they are and then adding on top of that, all of the unique experiences that each one of us has in our life, and, and this is especially true now as an adult, that 
your personality has been shaped differently. Your experiences have been have been entirely different. And so all of those combinations of how you were created and everything you've gone through and experienced makes you equally special. To me, that is one of the most empowering phrases that I've ever heard because it says it all. It says you are equal in terms of what you can do, but it also says you are very special as only you of 8 billion people that are living now and countless billions of people that have walked this earth over the years and are to come. You are special in in the fact that nobody else will ever be again like you. I had to stop you, forgive me, because that is just an incredibly empowering way to teach a child that you're not the same as everybody else, and that's perfectly okay, but you are still extremely special in that regard. Any follow-up on that before we we kind of put that aside? Yeah, it's, it's a, it, that is why every child going to take the subject of either sports or education or understanding differently. And and right. this you having the IQ and having the same question asked it does not really reflect the inner strength of a person. And the inner strength of a person really comes from a inner motivation to add value, motivation to do better. You know. As a, as a child, we have to make sure that they understand that if the divine force within them take charge of them rather than the human body, which is inherently insecure and going to be invested, infested in ego, fear, and greed, when that human body guides your brain, you are going to be compromised. But when your spirit, when your enlivening force within you guides you, you are, you are incentivized to serve the bigger divine force by adding the highest value. You are certainly part automatically into a competing against your last best to add the highest value. So you produce the right competitors in the universe who are motivated to improve their very best rather than worrying about somebody else making a better product and exceeding them and compromising your competition or destroying your competition or you know, you know, it's it's totally counterproductive because it you know big corporations many times when they cannot compete the small guys they buy them and suddenly and many times they would not take that technology or product on the market they would dump it. They would basically take the competition out. So have they done a greater service to the society? No, because that technology which they bought actually had better outcome than what this competition was making. So they have stopped a better uh, product or better service to be available to our society by buying that company and making that obsolete. Well, you've moved into that second topic again. You're so anxious to get in there, and I'm, I'm still holding you back, Ratanji. Um, <laughs> because, we, okay, we're, we're going to get those. And I hope I remember all these things you're, you're already bringing up that I want to come back to. But I want to finish that first First part, if you if you will with me, because again, I think that's already so critically important the way you've presented that. The idea of being equally special. 
How does that fit in with this trend for participation trophies? Because to me, participation trophies do not encourage the yes, they don't encourage competition because they don't keep score, but they also don't encourage improvement. They don't encourage being your best, doing your best, trying to figure out how I can learn from what I've done and improve on it. it it's to me, it and maybe that isn't the way it was intended, but I think the way it works is that it causes me to say, whatever I do is good enough. I'm going to get a trophy, whether I learned, you know, playing baseball, whether I learned how to catch the ball or whether I learned how to hit the ball or whether I learned how to throw the ball, which is the idea. If you're going to try to play the game, you're going to try to learn how to do it. It doesn't matter if I've made an effort to get better, I'm still going to get a trophy. So that doesn't match with being equally special. If you're equally special, it, it says, okay, even if you're not ever going to be the best player on the team, you can be the best at your efforts to, to compete, to play the game. So what is your thoughts on that? What, what do you think about that participation trophy mentality versus being equally special or or can they coexist you know in the in the basic reason for this new paradigm to exist is they found the major drawbacks in the old paradigms or ego driven uh, competition mm -hmm. because that was not good for the student or for the families or anything so basically they wanted that thing to be eliminated. So they basically thought we give everybody equal trophies and that would be eliminated. Nobody would have the higher ego. Right. Instead of that, instead of understanding why they have the ego and instead of implementing competition against self, against your last best, Instead of competing against the other boys, other girls, or other people, you are competing against your last best. That would have eliminated their ego, egoic thing. So by correcting one thing bad, they have introduced another defective things. So mm -hmm. you cannot improve that by using that. If the right thing is to maintain that incentive to improve your last best. Your competition has to be shifted from other competing with other people to competing with your own last best. So if, if you can give the trophy, people, person who has come second, but if that person who has come second in her earlier competition, she has come fourth. So from fourth, she has gone to second. So that is an improvement. So she deserves a trophy. So you can give the trophy to literally the person who is not the first, a different trophy. And but right. that would encourage them. Right. For improvement, most improved. Most you improved. Know, Yes, yeah. yes. Well, definitely, definitely agree with you on that. All right. We're going to take a break. When we come back after this break, we're going to get into the into that next topic that I know you're anxious on and it's so good to talk about. And what it really comes down to is competition versus cooperation. Do you want to drive those other companies into the ground, you know, and, and eliminate the value that they might have in the long run? Do you want to the idea of patenting and, and copywriting is, is that ultimately productive to box everybody else out of the marketplace? You know, financially, it certainly makes the most sense. Is that the way we were designed to really do things so that we have a spirit of cooperation? We work together. We'll talk about that. This is stress free living. We'll be back in just a moment. All right. 
90 seconds. Welcome. A few other new people. Liz has joined us. Kai has joined us. Good to have both of you and everybody else that has come in late. Who has a thought? Hello. Yeah. I think uh, the cooperation and self individual, they should be treated differently. <clears throat> because the objective of individual is to improve himself. The cooperation, as you have already said, is the objective is to make profit for the shareholders. So the objectives are different. So individuals can cooperate but corporations will only corporate for profit and other things. So the objectives are different. That mm -hmm. should be kept in mind and they should not be mixed together. That's a fair point. Thank you, Jackie. Who else? Anybody? This is a first. Well, I, well go I've ahead. got a <laughs> Who else there hasn't said something yet? Anybody who hasn't said? Kai, you open up your mic. Go ahead. I, I think, um, hi, everyone. Um, hi. So I think that, well, my thoughts about what he was, what he was saying wasn't about, he uses the term value a lot, but that's because it makes so much sense. The special or the difference or the, the part about everybody having um, being different, you were, you were making the point that they were all different and that's true. But what he's talking about or what I got from it is the equal in value. That's what he's talking about. Not that they're the same, but they're equal in value. Um, and I think I thought that there was a different topic. I thought it was on loneliness. So I was just listening, trying to figure out what the conversation was because the text said something about loneliness. So I, I didn't know what to where it was going. <laughs> we are back on Stress-Free Living. Ratanjit Sandy, yours truly, Ray Sam was with you today. Thank you so much for being with us. Having a uh, real interesting conversation with lots of feedback dur during our breaks. We had uh, some people we weren't able to get in on that one, and uh, we apologize to you. But we'll talk with our Zoom guests after the show. And so if you were a part of it that way, please feel free to join us so we can talk with you before, during, and after the program. Brother Sanjeet, in the remaining time that we've got here, let, let's take this into a bigger picture of competition within, say, the corporate world, the business world. It could also be uh, in any kind of an organization. It doesn't have to be a for-profit type business, but how, how does all this fit in there? One of our guests that is, is online with us here says that, you know, you can't mix apples and oranges. It, if, you're, if you're acting on an individual basis, what we've been saying is very true. We can try to make our best better. We can try to continually improve. We can try to constantly add more value. But once you get into a business corporate mentality, then it is about making money. So it is about boxing people out when you have a creative idea that you can patent. It is about squashing the competition because that's the way you make the money. So is this, is, you know, the idea of competition versus cooperation, I think people can see how it does make perfect sense on an individual basis even as a family, but does it make sense? Is it viable in the business world? So, so if something is constantly repeated, we begin to believe that. So constantly it has been said, the business is all about making money. So we believe that. Business is not about making money. It is all about adding the highest value. And the consequence of that is it, it allows to have the money come out because you, you are adding the needed value. Your product is needed. Your services are needed. So people buy that. And as a consequence, the company makes money. But ultimately, if the company is focused on only making money, 
but they don't have a service which is sellable. They don't have a product which is sellable. Are they going to exist? It's impossible. So we have to understand fundamental principle of a business. A business is, you know, we, we have constantly said we are working for stockholders. We are not. We are working for stakeholders. The stakeholders are the people who are working for the organization and people who are using our product, our society. So that is our primary pro responsibility of a corporation. Until that is corrected, we are going to have a very lopsided business uh, environment. And this is not good for us because if a business is focused on adding highest value through their product or services, everybody working in the organization would have the same mentality rather than they are focused on investing money we are focused on adding the highest service higher through the product or through the service right so let's let's go back to a couple of examples that you tried to slide in earlier let's talk about a patent or a copyright okay the the idea there is that one company or one individual in a company or whatever one group comes up with a thought that says, this is the best way to do this. This is a new procedure. This is a new invention, whatever it might be. And they patent copyright that, and now nobody else can duplicate that. And, and there's even restrictions in terms of trying to copy it to some point and change it a little bit because that they have those laws that say, no, this is protected. Earlier, I believe you said that what that does is it, it it doesn't allow us to take collectively as a group, cooperatively, an idea and improve it because it's kind of like taken out of society now. It's it is boxed out from everybody else's participation with that. Do you feel that we shouldn't have copyrights and patents? I mean. Should everything be fair game out there? And and so whatever company has invested potentially millions of dollars in, in designing this product, now they just give that back to society? Is that is that the way it should be better? If the inventor is a universal energy present within us, inventor is not the human body or all your creativity comes from the energy which enlivens this human body. So anything new which is invented by that energy should be a common property. And as a consequence, the society will grow itself. You know, Look at the company Walmart, which is the largest company in, in terms of number of sales. It was and retail sales, yeah. Retail sales. Retail sale is the oldest business in the world. Mm -hmm. They have done it in a different way, which is they have not filed for patent of for the ways they are doing it. So there, there is a different way to use the technology or, or the know-how in a way which adds higher value than the competition. And so you are, you are focusing everyone to think more creatively to add the higher value when the new fundamental science and technology is not patented. You come if you come if you can comprehend what I'm saying, it will dramatically change our entire society. Because, is that good? Okay. Go ahead. 
you had a chemical business. That's what you did. And, and you sold your property to a chemical, to a bigger chemical business. If that hadn't been copyrighted, if, if those, if you didn't have those patents, then I, there, I, wouldn't, there wouldn't only, have been value. I, I only filed two or three patents, which we never used them. So I never filed for a patent. Yet really nobody, nobody, even the Dow Chemical, could not, you know, copy our products or technology. Because never, if never it's, it's like this. If, if you make coffee and I make coffee, and your way of constructing that coffee is unique. And my way is different. But your, your coffee tastes better than mine. So although I can take your coffee and analyze it, but I will never be able to duplicate it. So some products cannot be duplicated simply by analyzing. This is obviously a game changer because that's at the very center of the corporate world. And, and we're really bringing it up as an example, though, of cooperation, of taking maybe not only my best and making it better, but taking somebody else's best and making it better because it, it eliminates the duplication of efforts. If you, if the society owns everything, if, if the business world owns all of the ideas that are out there in the world, in the business world, and can continue to escalate it from where it's already at, I mean, obviously that's, that's a paradigm shift of major proportion because right now every entity is an individual. Every group has to start from zero all the time in order to compete. So I guess you you said it unequivocally. You you really think that that, that is a mentality even in the corporate world that can that can survive, that can exist. Do you do you see that that the world would ever operate that way? Eventually, at once they realize, <clears throat> once they get away from the egoic, fear-filled, greed mentality, they would realize that. And that can only happen <clears throat> once we really realize who we are. Once we realize we are all part of the same energy and our fundamental purpose of existing is to serve that universal energy in the best way we can. And that energy exists in each individual. So to serve that energy is not done in temple or, or churches or synagogues or mosques or gurdwaras. It is done by serving another fellow human being or life, where life exists, or the environment. So the universal energy is omnipresent. We call God as omnipresent. So basically, the God is not one person sitting in the cloud and dictating everything. The universal energy has to be recognized and we serve that universal energy unconditionally in the best possible way we can, because universal energy is serving universal energy. Universal energy within us is serving the universal energy around us. So it is all the game of the universal power and and. There is no room for ego, fear, and greed in it. So until the, these things are taken out of the society, our society will be compromised and constantly we will have fights and undermining and cheating and all these problems basically exist because we don't understand who we are. 
Ratanji, we'll let that be our last word here today. Thank you so much for the very interesting, entertaining conversation that we've had about competition and how we teach our children or not to be competitive. Again, uh, using that one phrase that you talked about earlier, teaching our children and our fellow adults that we are we are equal, but more importantly, we are equally special. Thank you so much, Ratanjit, for your great ideas and conversation. And thank you to all of our guests for joining us. We appreciate you and value you. We hope that we've added value to your life. Remember, we're all playing the same game. Have a great day. We'll talk to you again soon. All right, we are clear. Let me verify that. We are. And now it's your turn, everybody. I, I know I cut some of you off earlier today. Please forgive me. I have to do that when we come back from breaks. But now the floor is yours. Let's hear from the youngest generation. Uh, Sahil, do you have a, a, some comments? He's, he's uh, studying chemical engineering in, in England, and uh, he's with us. Sahil? Hi, uh, uh, good morning and good evening to everyone. Uh, thank you, Dada, for this amazing chat. Thank you, Ray. I really enjoyed this conversation. And uh, to be very honest, I didn't really have any questions. Like I absorbed everything so clearly, so crystal clear that I really enjoyed the examples, like the General Motors example that you've given. And um, I pretty much understood everything. But I did have one question from one of our previous sessions that we had. And uh, which I'd like to ask if that's all right. Sure. Absolutely. Right. So uh, in the middle of the week, this random thought popped up into my head. From one of the previous discussions we had, uh, Dada, you'd mentioned that situations don't really disappoint us, but it is our expectations uh, from that situation that really disappoint us. So that really got me thinking and I had like a deeper thought of what really expectations are. So my, that was there's a conundrum that I was facing that I wanted to ask about that. So expectations really stem from our ambitions, our dreams, and our goals. That's why we expect things. And when we're asked to lower our expectations from situations, doesn't that in a way mean that we're giving up on our dreams and ambitions in some way when we're asked to aim lower? So that's the kind of conundrum that I seek to gain clarity on. Then there, there are two baskets. In one basket, we we have a expectation, dreams, and desires. They are all basically created by our insecurity, greed, and ego. Okay. I want to be bigger. I want to achieve this. I want to have bigger home. I want to have bigger car. I want to have bigger title. Mm -hmm. The other basket is our purpose-driven scenario. Our <laughs> basic purpose is to add the highest value and to service. So I have to consistently improve my serviceability. I have to continuously do better than my last best. And once you are focused on that, you would far exceed your expectation. You will far exceed your dreams. You far exceed your, or whatever you can ever imagine. So there mm -hmm. are two scenarios. So once you dream about something, bigger home or bigger thing, yeah, yes, you can achieve that. But could you achieve bigger than that when you did not, did not dream about this, you only focus on adding the highest value, you continuously uh, reach out for your divine creativity which exists within you to help you to do your better. So this is, this is a thought process which does not comply with all the books written on on dreams and uh, plan yourself and 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 if you goal have setting goal, and all of that yeah. goal, goal settings and all that so once right. you you do set goals yeah you can achieve that but could you have achieved more than that you can just 
you can do that if you focus on continuous improvement continuous improvement interesting i was thinking about like goals as well like you mentioned like dreams or desires that are based on like as you mentioned like the human body mode as in like having a car or desires not in that aspect like i was thinking of like goals like you mentioned like which are from our conscience in many ways from our soul like how we can add value to others in that regard as well like when we have for example if uh, i'd like to make use of the scenario to like better understand suppose there are two restaurants one restaurant is very like the owner is very profit driven where the other restaurant owner is like i want to feed people i don't want to make money off them but i really want to make sure that everyone has a good meal and the restaurant owner which is focused on profits he is receiving more amount of people than the other restaurant owner who is not receiving those many customers so in that kind of a situation when even when your mindset is instilled in adding the highest value but you're not getting results how do you motivate yourself or how do you lower your expectations in that aspect you first of all you're presuming that the person who is money driven is more successful person if, if there are two restaurants and one is more money driven they have fixed menu and you order whatever you want and they don't care and they you are not getting the right kind of treatment from so the other restaurant they welcome you and they basically modify the menu for what you want That's and awesome. and the service is amazing all of those things yeah obviously he they that restaurant is going to succeed mm -hmm. so it is a wrong yes. concept in our mind that the money driven person is more successful not really correct <laughs> they can only go so long but eventually uh, the pure minded restaurant owner will succeed interesting thank you yeah, yeah. Let, let me I'm, go ahead i'm sorry if you have i'm just going to add one other one other thought on your original question is that the expectations because i was a big part of of that conversation a couple of shows ago correct the expectations that i try to limit are not my own expectations for what i can do but it's expectations of what others will do or what the environment will do will allow me to do uh, i have learned uh, that i can only control me i can't control the situations i can't control what others are going to say or do in a in a response those are expectations that are terribly misguided because they basically we we set ourselves up to fail if we think people are going to do certain things around us or that you know it's going to be a sunny day when we get married and it ends up being rain i can't control that and my expectations were on these beautiful pictures outside with the sun and now it's raining so it's those expectations that that set us up to fail but my own expectations of me to add the highest value to to work harder to to work smarter to be more creative those i still have those are the ambitions that still drive me hopefully not for ego but but to add the value i still have those expectations of myself i just don't have expectations of other situations and other people around me i i try to have more acceptance of those because they are what they are but i don't try to have the expectation that they're always going to be perfect wow amazing that's really encouraging excellent excellent yeah all right thank you thank that, you. that was good thank you good to have you who else would like to uh, maybe uh, us when, oh go ahead no you go ahead you go ahead i always talk please go ahead uh, okay thanks well uh, just to to go back to the conversation that we had today um one of the concepts that kind of stuck that i was thinking about from an interview i heard with simon snack he's a non-fiction author and speaker and he's a consultant for fortune 100 companies He talked about the difference between infinite games and finite games where finite games are like where there's clear winners and losers and that goes back to like the sporting competitions that we've talked about um and infinite games are more about like life that we're playing the game of life that we're playing when he was saying that he gave talks at Apple and Microsoft and Apple was really focused on really 
creating the best products for their customers and always trying to improve for their customers. And Microsoft was just talking about how they can beat Apple in their next product. And that just kind of a, goes back to like the shift that we were talking about today of making your best better. So just wanted to add that concept because that kind of helps me when I think about this is an infinite game. So I need to make my best better. And then another thought I had, because I have a young daughter, she's seven right now, is trying to have her always thinking about making her best better. And I try to do that as well, is how can we measure ourselves? Because what you measure matters. So how can I track my progress? So I can, and how can I do that for my daughter? Like seeing how her reading is improving or how her athletic abilities are improving or you know, things like that. So those are just kind of some reflections I had on today's call. Ray? Oh, I, I thought you were going to answer that last one, Rathanjee. How do you, how do you, uh, you know, I think before I give my answer on your child, um, as a parent of four kids, and then when they get married, you have eight kids, um, and then you have the grandkids, Everything is filtered as a as a father or as a grandfather. Everything is filtered because you you say that your son or your daughter or your grandchild and you love them so completely and full, totally that you automatically make excuses and and you and your acceptance level is because you love them no matter what. So you accept them for what they are. So I think it's really difficult with your own daughter to be able to see the growth in some areas and her hesitance for whatever reason for growth in other areas, because you are so close to her and you love her no matter what she does or doesn't do. Un true, unconditional love. So I, I, you know, I, I often share those conversations with my wife because I'm hoping that between the two of us then, we will see things a little more clearly as to what we want to help them do or or how we can help them advance their abilities in life based on our collective conversation because when you've got another person involved in that assessment i think it's a little bit more true even if they both love unconditionally i think they both are a little more now you're having a conversation with somebody else and, and the filtering in my mind is a little bit less. So that would be the first thing I would say on that is that do that with Sam and, and say, you know, what do you think? How do you think she is progressing? Let's be as honest about it as we can, because it doesn't, it isn't fruitful to not address the issues that need to be addressed most. And some of the obvious, you know, it, it's easy to see that she's reading better. It's very easy to see that and that, and, and you want to encourage that. But what about the things that you're overlooking because of your unconditional love? Um, and perhaps the conversation that says, let's really, you know, as a parent, let's truly do these assessments because we want to inspire her to be much better. That's my take. I appreciate that. Thank you. I like that a lot. You uh, basically one thing which is very important is uh, we are focused so much on results, but if we focus on our intentions more than results, results would follow. So make sure her intention, and secondly, to support the intention is effort. Those two things cannot be sacrificed. They have to be higher and higher, and they will bring about the results. Results is only the a, a, a clock which we use to measure the timing for our running race. And but the race is won by by the techniques, by the effort, by the intentions, and not by the clock. I love that. So focusing on how hard she's working and her intention to improve yeah. and the results will come. I love yeah. that. Thank you. And for myself as well. I mean, that's for all of us. It's not just for yeah, the children. Yeah. That's beautiful. 
you should comment on intention and effort more than on the result. We wait till the result happens, then we say, oh, you have done a good job. But if your intention was great and if your effort, you are constantly innovating yourself to find the new ways to do things, those things should be encouraged more, more so than, than the result. You know, and I have to add this. It, it's just another, one of the very first things Ratanjit said to me 20 years ago was he said, if somebody pulls a, 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 a gun and, and pulls the trigger on a gun, but for whatever reason, the gun didn't go off, are they any less guilty than the person who did pull the trigger and the gun went off? And the answer is no, really. Ultimately, it's no, because the intention was to pull the trigger and to, and to shoot somebody. And the fact that the gun misfired is irrelevant, okay? So the intentions Ratanji talked about is, is perfect, brilliant, and, and it's great, but also the intentions to do badly Okay, the intentions to not perform properly, just because the results didn't play out the way the intentions were, you need as a as, a, as we all need as an individual to look where did the intentions go, both positively and negatively. And I think a lot of times we we forgive the negative intentions because the results didn't go bad, but they were still negative intentions that need to be corrected. And that was that was powerful when he told me that. I've never forgotten that story. That's interesting. Thank it's, you. It, you have to remember every success is a failure and every failure is a success. Because when we succeed, we succeed in spite of our shortcomings. And we we camouflage our shortcomings, which we are not able to improve. And failure basically discourses our shortcomings so we can note down and we can improve. It gives us the opportunity to improve, not that we... So we must celebrate our failures and be grateful for successes because in spite of our shortcoming, we succeeded. So we should not take the full credit for our successes we should always be grateful for those. It made me think of something um, uh, in, every, in this conversation. It was my mom and the way that she raised me to always be um, the best that I could be. And for me, I never experienced jealousy because ever, ever in, my, in my life because I always focused on just being a better me. And so I teach something in my classes with my students called intentionality. And intentionality, intention plus personality equals intentionality. So sometimes you have the right intention, but when it meets your personality, it may come across the wrong way. So when we have intentionality and we put those two things together with our personality or intention, as long as it's based upon integrity and to do the right thing for the right reason, then whatever your personality is, it will fuse into a way that's a creative way of being you and the way you work in the world. And so I um, I think the way we, I don't know that we measure it that way because you said something, there's so many things going around in my head as a teacher, an educator, uh, uh, it, it made me think of how we create that measurement. And it's the same way that we do it as humans and as adult souls, when we become a solid soul, we're that way because we can understand that we can make a different choice and that our choices or the quality of our choices the next time helps us to understand um, that we are improving, that, that that's the measure. It's not necessarily that you can physically measure those kinds of things, but emotionally, mentally, psychologically, spiritually, it's the conscious awareness of the choice that now says, okay, we've gotten better. And in the same way, that's kind of how I look at dealing with young people as well. I can tell by the quality of the next best choice that they've gotten better. So I don't know that we can measure it from a physical standpoint like many other sciences, but that's a, a good way of measuring that with children, I think, and in the same way with us as adults. What is my quality of choice the next time and the peace that I have within about the choice. Thank you. 
good. Let's see. We have we, we have not heard from Dr. Marsh today. Any comments? Um, yeah. It, uh, first of all, I appreciate it. My mother was a teacher, so I really appreciated her comments. And I love the term she came up with. Um, there are so many things that ran through my head. Uh, with the Browns are in the playoffs, and I'm thinking – if each person does its best or that person's best, um, Miles Garrett, who's the line, the lineman who talks about doing the best he can. And if everybody on the team does the best they can, they have a better chance of winning. In other words, it's not competition with each other, but each person doing the best they can. And in that way, the team has a better chance of winning. So by doing the best that each person can do, that increases the chance of a positive outcome. And then we're grateful regardless of whether we win or lose. So that's sort of where my head was today. Um, you know, you often seen some of, some of the best teams end up losing. When they play a game not to lose, they lose. When they claim, when they play a game just to give their best performance, um, they win. It's, it's really true. The other thing that um, the other thing that I would talk about is, uh, and part of most of a lot of the success has to do with Dr. Sanji. But uh, your listeners may know, but I'm a dentist, and um, we know that coming to the dentist is not everybody's favorite thing. It's nobody's favorite thing, and we do procedures on the patient. So every day when people ask me what my mission statement is to treat others the way you want to be treated, uh, we don't need a fancy thing. And then what we try to do, whether it's wiping them with a Kleenex, whether it's welcoming them properly, uh, each person on my team needs to do the best that they can to make the experience that, that good for the other patient. And I think a lot of the reason we have we've continued to, I'm not saying succeed, but continue is because the patients understand that we're trying to do the best for them, what they want to be done in a kind uh, way. And that is the, when people ask me about practice building and advertising marketing, it's pretty much what Ratanji said about trying to do the best you can providing value. And I've often kidded to him that I'm going to continue to work as long as I can because of that reason that that's the way that in this society I can provide value for others. Just use the word um, better instead of best. And when you deliver what the customer ex expect is mediocrity. When you deliver more than what a customer expects that is excellence. Say that again, Rathaji. When you deliver a service, what a customer expect, that is mediocrity. When you deliver higher than what a customer expect, that is excellence. Hmm. All right. Any I, comment, I, Ray? Yeah, I absolutely agree. I, I'm going to use that. <laughs> I was inspired many years ago um, after reading uh, some discoverhope.com literature. Um, I'm a writer, a little bit. I'm not a great writer. I'm learning to be a, more of a writer. But after reading some of Ranjit's literature, I, I've always taken words and changed them around and made them mean what I wanted them to mean. So I was inspired to write 10 definitions of words that were my favorite words, like integrity and excellence and things of that nature. And then it kept growing in my mind about consciousness to the point where I call something Christmas consciousness. So if we all have the Christmas consciousness, and I think that's what he was talking about going back to earlier today in terms of constructing business and corporate concepts and and patents and things of that nature. If we have a mindset or a consciousness collectively 
to do good and to share and to uh, see that we're part of the divine collective as opposed to the me, me, I, I kind of thing. It's kind of like what Dr. Marsh just said, which is what reminded me of that. My commitment is to, you know, to be in excellence, to do more, to do better, to make people feel really good in this moment. And of for me, dentist is terrifying. So most people feel that way, but his desire and his intention to make people feel at peace and ready to receive the service. So in the same way, we go back to the beginning of the conversation or the part that I came in on, the, the business construct and the corporate construct and the patent. If we're all thinking in terms of the collective as opposed to the individual, and we recognize that we're a part of the all and the one, and then our, what I call Christmas consciousness would always be in effect. So when you're pleasant during the holidays, imagine if you were like that every day. So take your Christmas mindset every day with the hello and exchanging nice cities and Merry Christmas and Happy New Year and be that every day and imagine the world that we could have not only individually but collectively because we're all on the same mindset of oneness, of love, of value, and of just um, not only adding the highest value but being the highest value. Very good. Beautiful. You should do a show instead of me. <laughs> I should do a show with you. <laughs> I need you. The world needs you. <laughs> Rakesh, we haven't heard from you for a while. Go ahead. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, well, you know, I'm listening. I'm enjoying. I think the diversity of ideas is very stimulating so thank you uh well you know I, i'm always a big picture type of person you know like paradigm you know constructs you know that's how my mind works and so i'm just listening to all of you i'm thinking what's the biggest question here you know so it is it comes down to me about individual interests versus collective good that's what competition is all about is it going to be a zero sum game or is it going to be good for all? And so this is a construct that you know humanity needs to decide which one, which one they want to live. And you know, unless there is a larger you know, change in our perspectives, we are going to have this competition until we die, all of us, and the earth is destroyed. So I mean, that's the way it's going to go. Uh, the good news is that there are constructs in our world literature where they talk about these kinds of things. And they talk about the cooperation is the best way to live our lives. You just become your own best and you don't try to harm the other individual in, in, in any way, shape or form. And that is the formula for a peaceful, prosperous world. But it has changed quite a bit. And so unless, you know, there is a, a real movement towards that, you know, I don't see any, any, uh, any kind of hope. I mean, I hate to be pessimistic like that, but it, that's the way it is. It, it, this will need a sea change in the way humans look at ourselves. Yeah. I think we must be the change. Yep. I, I, I also am not optimistic that in my lifetime, the corporate world will eliminate patents and copyrights and all work together. I, I don't see that happening in the foreseeable future because we're too based on money. And in the short term, money is more obtained with, I think the perception at least is that I can obtain more money by patenting my idea and running with it exclusively. But I do have hope that... Um, you know, there's been a lot of paradigm shifts in the world. A lot of things are happening today that never happened before. And maybe people will start getting wise to it. You know, may I one more thing as an example of that. And, you know, I know I often talk about uh, the ancient uh, Indian culture. So if you, you can Google this, anybody can Google this. If you just Google three key words or key phrases, the size of ancient Vedic literature, then size of ancient Latin literature and size of ancient Greek literature, you will fall off your chair. You know, if you combine all ancient 
uh, you know, literature or different, different cultures, you combine them and add and multiply that by a thousand, you, you would still not read, I mean, reach the size of Vedic culture. Uh, so there's so much literature out there, so much knowledge. None of that was patented. None of that was, you know, it was left out there for greater human good. So we have examples of that. And lots of ideas were borrowed from those, you know, that literature, the vast literature, and converted into profitable, you know, ventures. So we have we have all of that in plain sight. We just need to look at them. You know, basically, if you study all the literature, Vedas and ancient literature, you will become a tremendously learned person. But you will still remain the same until you change your habits. Because we live our habits, we do not live our knowledge. So that is what has happened. I have met with so many great <clears throat> scholars. They talk something amazing. They live something different. And another thing is, we talk about hope. We only control ourselves. Basically, whenever in my seminars and my workshops, a, a lot of question people ask after the seminar, how do I change my son to do this? How do I change my husband to do this? Basically, if you are constantly working on changing others, you will never do that. It is by changing yourself, you change others. So we are really not here to change the world. We are here only to... The reason I enjoy doing this show is many times things which come out of my mouth, I, I learn from them and I implement them in my own life. And it's, it's, it's a process which has never stopped. And basically, I'm not teaching others, I'm trying to teach myself. But I, I do have a question, though, on that. So that is, I think, in my humble opinion, just partially true. If that were to be true, then why the world hasn't changed? And it's actually changing for the worse. So just doing that on an individual basis and to expect that everybody is going to do that is just not going to, it's not realistic. There one, has to be some one, kind of leadership that... never change. You know, con continuously you are going to have evils in the world. Continuously you have to have all these things and you are going to have good people and bad people. So you'll never convert the whole thing into good goodness. So there, yeah. not the whole thing, but you know. So like we have guidelines today for a lot of stuff. We have laws, you know. So there should be no reason for having laws if we just can do on on individual basis, you know. So there there would be no need for external regulations or you know or philosophies. You know, if we can just in, in on an individual basis change ourselves and hope that the entire world is going to change, I mean, I don't see the practicality in it with all due respect. You know, uh, there has to be a greater movement that gives people the guideposts. Without that, you know, uh, you know humans are not going to just change on their own. I mean, that's that's just not a realistic idea. Maybe, you know, somebody like you can do that. You know, I think I can do it. And I try to do it. But look, people look uh, at people around us. I mean, they not only don't see any value in it, they think it's, it's stupid to think like that. That will always remain. 
Oh. But it's a matter of preponderance of people who think that way versus preponderance of people who think, you know, in a better way. And I think there was a time in the history of humanity, you know, in certain parts of the world where that's the way people live their lives. And it was because they had great teachers. They had people who explained things like why the code of conduct. And a lot of this was codified in ancient Vedas. And they were codified for a reason because there were guidelines for people to follow. And so that's just my, you know, uh, just my way of looking at it. I may be wrong. You know, I keep my mind open, but just wanted to express that. Yeah, it's, you know, we look at uh, ancient time, uh, the Mahabharata, the, the war, that all those mindset, they existed in, in Pandavas and, you know, those things. They basically still they are they are basically multiplications of they they exist today. So basically, the humanity has not changed much. All right. Anybody else have any last thoughts today? Appreciate the, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four of you that have hung on till the end. Uh-oh, we just lost one. <laughs> three of you that have hung on till the end of this lengthy well, conversation. It, yeah, maybe next time, you know, I, I, I once again, um, you know, I wanted to say something. Mahabharata war, when it ended, all the, all the specialized weapons, if you believe what's written in that epic, they were destroyed. They were destroyed on purpose, so that never happens again. That is the way it's described in that epic. You know, right now, we not only not destroy those weapons, we're making more of them. And so there is a difference. It's not the same. Yeah, it, there, there are always going to be differences. But, ultimately but but th that's a profound difference, you know. It's not just it's just any difference, you know. It's a philosophical difference that's huge with far-reaching consequences for humanity. The biggest and, hope is life and birth, because every human being which is exists today is going to die. Right. So good and bad is going to finish with them. So new generation is going to come fresh and. And if we can inculcate this wisdom in the new generation, we'll change the humanity. And that's why let's, we're here. Let's, let's hope so. <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I get out of most of what I've learned from Ranchichi for the last 10, 12 years, and, and just in life in general. It's not about what we're just getting now, but it's about what we're leaving behind. And we have to be very intentional about that because if you look at all these different movements, the social movements, the political movements that are happening in this time, in particular with all these universal shifts, you know, it is important right now that we make a decision how we're going to move forward and know that this infinite love agenda, which I call it, because that is the infinite power. If we move forward with that infinite concept of unconditional love, unconditional gratitude and oneness, and we are able to, just like we I see them indoctrinating kids in school all the time. I look at, let's say, the LGB movement, all of these new movements that are uh, happening in society, whether you agree or disagree, these things are happening now because of the way that the universe is, is open, the portals that are open right now. And those of us who want to forward the agenda of oneness and the agenda of value can actually make a collective um, and powerful move if we band together in the same way, follow certain constructs and that's in the same way that they did to get this agenda out because it is important, not just what we believe now, but what we understand about the legacy we leave into the future. Yep. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much.